focused, I think that's a huge edge. And if you ask me, like, what's my core philosophy? It's watch. <laughs> you know, it, because yeah. when you watch, you learn. And when you're looking at stats, you learn a different way. But you understand what the markets are reacting to versus, you know, sometimes your eyes will tell you something and the stats will tell you something else. And I believe my eyes. Um, and totally. that's an edge that I have over I, someone that's, that's that's just focused exclusively on, on betting the numbers, which the NFL – marketplace is largely like all the sports betting marketplace are basically you know the wise guys are betting numbers so when you're watching uh and picking things up if you know what to look for it can really help yeah i totally agree all right so oh we're gonna get into this video guys don't forget to subscribe to wager talk tv here on youtube and follow us on twitter at wager talk this video will be like teddy said earlier top 10 nfl betting tips my favorite sport to watch and sometimes the most frustrating sport to bet on sometimes. Teddy, start us off with number one. All right, well, let's start with this. Is that the, every sport's frustrating sometimes. <laughs> yes. You know, baseball's I, frustrating. We have a right side winner, the bullpen blows it, and then you're under shot and all of that. You know, basketball's frustrating. We have those foul and three-point situations. Your team dominated for 39 minutes. And the NFL uh, can be very frustrating when you feel like you have right sides and your team keeps on Getting stopped on yeah, downs at the two-yard line and then turning the ball over inside their own 10 and they dominate the game, but they lose by two touchdowns. All sports can be frustrating. <laughs> yeah. That being said, you when you have more right, right wrong sides, you're gonna have more bad beats and more tough beats, you know? <laughs> uh, because yeah. you have these right sides, they're not turning out right. So I, I don't look at the NFL as being a sport that's incredibly frustrating. In fact, uh, in terms of my personal track record, NFL's been my best sport for the last five years. Um, Good. You know, if you grade them all out, uh, and certainly my track record in NFL for two decades has been pretty darn good. So it's a sport that I like, and I'm going to start right here. You say the number one tip for beating the NFL. Number one, it's not about how good teams are; it's about how good teams are relative to their market value. We're recording this over the summer in 2020, last year. I'm going to give three teams that had disappointing 500 or below seasons. The Rams. The Rams, disappointing start to finish last year. They went to the Super Bowl the year before. Yeah. Arizona, they didn't have a winning record. They were breaking a rookie quarterback. Dolphins, the first five weeks of the year, they're the worst team in the NFL history. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Dumpster fire. Mm -hmm. All three of those teams were better than 60% ATS last year. So it's not yeah. about how good they are. It's about how good they are relative to to where the markets are pricing them. And that is such a key issue. Yeah, so-and-so might be the best team, so-and-so might be the worst team, but if the markets are pricing them as the best team and the worst team, the value's not there. So what you're looking mm -hmm. for is a differential between how good a team is and where the markets are pricing that team. We'll talk about how to establish that differential as we move forward. But the number one tip, not about how good they are, it's about where the market value is compared to how good they are. Makes sense. All right, Teddy, moving on to number two. Well, all that said, you know, I just talked about how the Rams were a good bet last year in Arizona and Miami. Of course, none of those teams uh, finished better than 500. None of those teams make the playoffs. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said for the most basic strategy that I can think of. Bet on good teams. Bet against bad teams. Okay. Now, identifying the bad teams or the underachievers early is a big piece of the process. Mm -hmm. But last year, the Bears, the Chargers, the Browns, the Lions, the Bucks, the Redskins, the Bengals, they were all the worst. Uh, those were the worst point spread teams in football. And each okay. of the squads was 500 or worse, straight up. So it's the bad teams, especially – Bad teams that come into the season with some hope, like the Bears and the Chargers and the Browns. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, they're money makers. And you compare those numbers betting against the bottom feet. Look at the look at the good teams last year. The Chiefs, the Saints, the Bills, the Ravens, the Packers. They were all 60% plus ATS mm -hmm. last year. And that's not atypical. You go back to the year before, it's the same story. If you bet if you can successfully identify good teams and bad teams early. You're way ahead of the curve, okay? If you just bet on good teams and bet against bad ones, in general, you're likely to make a profit betting the NFL. So we talk about market value, 
but we also have to talk about how good the teams actually are. <laughs> and uh, when you put one and two together, you find your bet on and bet against teams for any given week. All right. Bet on good teams, bet against bad ones. Seems easy. Number three, Teddy? Well, yeah, it seems easy <laughs> uh, in theory. But, of course, at the beginning of last year, did you know the Bears were going to be wildly underachieving? Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. or the Chargers or the Browns. Uh, mm-hmm. That said, if you watched all three of those teams play week one, you might say, you know what? <laughs> Maybe these are bet against teams moving forward. So it's not always quite – it's easy in retrospect. It's not always easy looking forward. So I don't want to make people right. oh, it's super easy. It's not easy. But – if you can identify teams that are going to be good and teams that are going to be bad, you'll make money with it. You flat out will. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Number three is know the stats that matter. Okay. And this is everything, you know, box scores, not final scores. It's a, a mantra yeah. that we talk about through, uh, regardless of sport, baseball, basketball, football. You want to be paying attention to yardage numbers. You want to be paying attention to first downs numbers. You want to be paying attention to turnover numbers. And look, the advanced metric numbers that matter. Okay. The most basic mm-hmm. differential between two NFL teams, look at their yards per play gained on offense yep. and their yards per play allowed on defense. And that's your basic metric for how good is this team. Now, early in the season, you're going to see some numbers that are wildly off. You mm-hmm. know, week one, the team you know has 40 plays for 200 yards and then they have a 95-yard touchdown catch. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And all of a sudden, uh, now it's 41 plays for 295 yards. And their stats are off compared to what it uh, – but certainly you can adjust for big plays early in the season. But recognize, yards per play on offense, yards per play on defense, that's the stats. That's the single okay. stat that matters the most in the NFL. Okay. Now, you also want to talk about turnover differential here. When you see a team, especially early in the season, that has a positive or negative turnover differential, you have to ask yourself one question. Is this systemic or is it random? Teams with good quarterbacks, teams with Mm -hmm. defenses that create pressure, teams with defenses that have good secondaries, they're supposed to win the turnover battle. It's not random. It's systemic. Teams with young quarterbacks and bad offensive lines and limited secondaries, they're not supposed to win turnover battles. And that, too— is systemic. But what you'll see the markets do, they'll react to these turnovers like they're completely random. You know, mm-hmm. team, was, team A is minus four in turnovers week one. Uh, and the like, markets are like, oh, well, they'll be better. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. not a team with a rookie QB and a bad offensive line or a defense is not going to create turnovers. Those are the type of teams, again, we talk about at the top, betting on good teams, betting on, against bad teams. At the very top, yeah. talking about teams relative to their power rating strength, all right, Uh, or betting on teams relative to their market value. When you talk about turnovers, turnovers really affect final scores, okay? Mm -hmm. (laughs) They make the final scores look far, you know, oftentimes far worse than the, make the final score look different than how the game was played. Uh, If you can identify a team that early in the season has a negative turnover differential that is likely to be positive by the end of the season, or a team that has a negative turnover ratio, turnover ratio early that is going to continue to lose the turnover battle. You can see it right from the bat. Those are teams you can bet in two different directions. Um, you know, the, the team that's going to continue to have turnover problems now becomes a bad team and a bet against team, and that's the team you're going to bet against. The team mm-hmm. that struggled early and had a negative turnover differential, but now it's not systemic. It's more random. You know, the quarterback play- plays decent, or they have pass rushes there, and the secondary can make plays, and that team started with a negative turnover differential. You say, wow. This team now has value because their final scores look so ugly, and they come up. So turnovers are a key piece of this equation, but you need to be able to recognize the difference between a team that, when you look at them, there's no way they can be positive turnover differential at the end of the year, and teams that had a bad lock early and are likely to be able to turn that around. Very good one. Um, number four, Teddy covers. Is this 101 stuff? I don't know if it's 101 stuff. It's not really 101. We kind of went over that, like 101. This is more like 102, maybe. Sure, sure. So, uh, I, and, I, and again, there's there's a ton of legit 101 info for betting NFL out there. I know yeah. I don't step up, uh, but I wanted to do stuff that that's meaningful. You know, I wanted to give mm-hmm. tips that I, I actually think will help people. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, 
I apologize if it's going over, uh, if it's a little bit uh, uh, complicated here. Uh, that said, uh, I'm assuming most of you get what the heck I'm talking about. So thank don't you for apologize watching. for anything, Teddy. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, ask my wife that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> don't apologize. All right, Teddy, moving on to uh, number four. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about spots because spots, many bettors consider spots to be the key to NFL. And I, I don't necessarily disagree with that assessment. There's certainly one piece of the equation, and they're going to help you understand the point spreads out there. The markets are really going to react to what we call spots. Even if Team A is great and Team B is miserable, the point spread may not be as high as you think it's going to be. The markets are going to react to what we call letdowns, a team coming off a big game, a team coming off a divisional game, or even better, a series of big games and divisional games when you have two big games in a row, and then the third week you play a bottom feeder and you're laying 14 and a half, those tend to be problematic. Right. <laughs> uh, so recognize the letdown spot. Recognize the look-ahead spot. You know, Again, you're facing the bottom feeder here, and next week you got a division game, and the week after you have a national TV game against the Patriots. Guess what? You, know, what's a, you're, you can easily get caught looking ahead, and the markets will price that in. Be aware. Sandwich spots, that's your classic. You know, you're, you have a huge game one week, and then you're playing this bottom feeder this week, and then you have a huge game the next week. Uh, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the intensity isn't what it should be for that middle game, the sandwich game during the stretch. Right. The markets will react to that. Uh, or stepping up in class or stepping down in class, especially early in the season. Teams, strength of schedule matters a lot in September. You know, teams who all comes out of the gate and they face three elites and now uh, they're 0-3 and the markets are like, this team stinks and they're coming home to play the Bengals. <laughs> and, and guess what? You know, maybe they don't stink quite as bad as you thought they were uh, because their strength yeah. of schedule has been really tough. Similarly, right. you know, a, a team that's been beating up, you see it all the time. Cowboys last year started out 3-0. and oh, Yeah, Dallas is going to kill everyone. And you're like, well, they didn't actually beat anybody yet. And now they start yeah. facing real teams and they win five games the rest of the year. You know, so... Uh, recognize especially early, but even in November and December, those step up and step downs in class matter a lot. The letdowns, the look aheads, the sandwich spots, people will be betting those all year long and the markets will be reacting to those all year long. So note the spots and teams in bad spots aren't likely to receive a whole lot of wise guy attention. All right. Number four was spots. Number five. Teddy. Okay, so a lot of the time, I mean, we've talked about the idea of reverse line movement. I'm like, it's garbage. Yeah. We've talked about playing contrary, you know, you just find the team with the biggest consensus on them and you bet against them. I'm like, yeah, not so much. Mm -hmm. If there's one sport that I want to have at least some contrarian bent in, that's the NFL. If you're on all the popular public sides in the NFL every week, you will not make a profit this year or next year or any year. Um, when you're talking about contrarian, I'm not talking about 60% or 65% of the consensus sites. I'm talking about 70% plus, you know, 75% hmm. plus public sides. Uh, and it's not every game. There's a big difference between a 75% public side for the early Sunday games when there's 10 games going on versus the late Sunday game with the one TV marquee matchup versus the Sunday night game versus the Monday night game. You know, the TV games, I'm definitely looking to play contrarian more than mm -hmm. I would uh, for a, you know, a 1 p.m. Eastern, you know, 10 a.m. Pacific Sunday game. Um, uh -huh. That said, you need to find a reason to take a team that's just, oh, everyone's betting it the other way. You know, there's got to be some rationale uh -huh. for the bet other than straight contrarian. But the NFL yeah. is one sport, particularly for the TV games that you need to have at least some contrarian bent in your arsenal. You can't be playing the the, the public favorites uh, week in, week out in the TV games and expecting to, uh, to come away with a significant profit. So uh, most times when I like a team, you know, it's a Sunday night game or a Monday night game and, the, you know, the whatever team is getting 70% plus support and I like them, most of the time I'll end up leaving that game alone. I'm not going to bet the other way. I like the one side. But most of the time, I, I'm going to stay on the sidelines there. Uh, so the yeah. NFL is one sport where you have to pay at least some attention to contrarian thought. Um, much more so, I think, than other sports. Wow. Oh, okay. 
Good one, Teddy. Number six, we're flying through this, Teddy. Sorry, T. Well, well yeah, Teddy T. Uh, Teddy T. <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, we're starting to fly through this. Uh, yeah. And this, you know, so I, I broke this out into three. I'll call it mm -hmm. Know the Math Part 1, Know the Math Part 2, Know the Math Part 3. Uh, so this is like 6, 7, and 8. But let's start with Know the Math Part 1. Okay. Point spreads versus money lines. All right. The NFL is a point spread sport. Mostly we play point spreads. Yeah. There are certainly all kinds of opportunities to play money lines with favorites or underdogs in the NFL. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm laying less than a field goal, I'll often lay the price with the favorite. Uh, when I'm uh, taking a dog that I think is live to win the game, I'll often take them uh, at least a portion of my wager uh, on the money line. Find yourself, I mean, they're, they're out there. They're very easy to find a point spread versus money line conversion chart. So you understand uh, what, what you're giving up when you're taking a dog on the money line and what you're giving up mm -hmm. when you're, uh, when you're uh, taking a favorite minus the points. Favorite. Uh, yeah. And then again, with the dogs, I'm only playing the short favorites on the money line. I'm not someone that's going to play the three dollar favorites on the money line uh, in the right. NFL. Um, that's again my strategy. But understanding the math between point spreads and money lines, knowing when you're going to when it's better to make the wager, taking or laying the points, and when it's better to be yeah, just asking the team to win straight up. Um, totals too. You want to be knowing your math. What are the key numbers? You know, we talk about key numbers in the NFL, threes and sevens. We talk about key numbers for totals, 41, 42, 45, 48, 49, 52, on and on down the line. Um, you want to know your key numbers and, uh, numbers, and certainly uh, when it comes to betting the over-unders, the totals, uh, on a week-in, week-out basis. You want to know your math. Uh, you want some, mm -hmm. uh, some, some semblance of history so you're not flying by the seat of your pants. You know, how many games lined at 56 end up going over? Um, that's something you want to know. And of course, uh, one of the things that I'm proud of being associated with the sports memo wager talk guys is that there's so much good info. Ralph Michaels sheets uh, are tremendous for this kind of stuff. So uh, I'll give Ralph a shout out right here. Uh, it's something Ooh. that's worth looking at. Um, mm -hmm. and of course you get it for free, uh, when you come to uh, uh, wager talk or sports memo. Absolutely. Ralph, uh, as Marco and Kelly call him the stat daddy, Michaels. All right. Step number seven, know the math part two, Teddy. Uh, yeah, and this is a, um, derivatives and props. We talk about beating the NFL, and your standard NFL wagers are sides and totals, obviously. And then right. people start talking about, all right, you know, do we want to play first halves? You know, I want so and so in the first half. When you really get into derivatives and props, you know, I'll talk about props in a minute. But you know, you have the first score or no score. You have first quarter numbers. You have first half numbers. You have first half totals, and, and then you have all the player props. There are a lot of different ways to get at the same basic bet. I don't know. Week one, you like the Saints over the Bucks. Let's just say Saints are minus four against uh, Tampa. Four. Okay. Yeah. And let's say you like the Saints against Tampa in Brady's uh, first game. All right. So maybe uh -huh. you say when when you start doing the handicap of the game, you're like, well, this is a spot where. Tom Brady isn't going to be able to throw against the Saints defense and New, or and New Orleans is going to be able to run the football really effectively. Bang. Now you're looking for Brady under props. You're looking for Kamara over props. You know, the yep. player props be as a piece of your handicap can become a big piece of the equation. And even mm -hmm. though when it comes to props, the, the, the totals are much lower at sports books for most betters. It's not going to, you know, really, if you're not betting, five, ten times a game, the, the you're going to be able to get down reasonable wagers uh, as a percentage of your overall bet on the game uh, when it comes to betting these props as well. So you can bet sides, you can bet totals, but there are many other areas where you can get involved with a wager based solely on your opinion about how the game's going to flow. The same handicap, the same work that you're doing that gets you a, 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 a side or a total bet for the game can get you multiple derivative wagers, multiple prop wagers that in theory should be positive expectation bets. So when I say know the math, you know, recognize what the juice is on these. The juice on the props tends to be a little bit higher. Your, 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 uh, yeah. uh, your winning percentages need to be a little bit higher when you're laying minus 115 and minus 120 over the long term. They do to, to when you're laying minus 10, uh, 110 or minus 108. Um, so, uh, and certainly when you start doing the math on the player props, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to find opportunities out there. Uh, you know, player player the player props are a, lot, a ton of work, but when mm-hmm. you put the work into them and you understand the math behind them, there's certainly money to be made. Absolutely, I totally agree. All right, step eight: know the math, part three. Yeah, and of course, we're, we're, we have separate videos on how to bet teasers, what type of parlays even professional bettors look for. Um, Mm -hmm. We have in-game, we have specific videos for each of these three subjects, but I wanted to make sure I included them here in this this one-on-one video. Uh, Because certainly if you're looking to expand your betting repertoire above sides and totals, above first half, first quarters, no scores, props, all of that, teasers, parlays, and in-game are absolutely a piece of the equation. And don't let anyone tell you the pros don't bet teasers. The pros absolutely bet teasers, specifically okay. six-point teasers crossing the key numbers of three and seven. So you're taking your favorites down from over a touchdown to less than a field goal. You're taking your underdogs mm-hmm. up from less than a field goal to over a touchdown. Pros sometimes bet parlays, you know, and especially I love week 17 NFL parlays where if team A wins the early game, then team B is going to rest their starters in a late game, that sort of thing. You can find some interesting correlated parlays in the NFL that the books don't recognize as being correlated. Um, oh. So, uh, you know, week 17 is, is, is a prime example of uh, how you can take advantage of that. And, of course, in-game betting, um, you know, we could do whole video. Um, there are whole videos on in-game betting. I've done one. I know there are several out there uh, mm-hmm. in, the, uh, in the archives. Um, certainly recognize that in-game has enormous advantages. You can get on or off bets. You can you can have a position that you know a position you took before the game. You can get off it at no cost or limited cost uh, before you lose the initial wager. Uh, you know there's there's all kinds of great stuff you can do in game, but in game is also the crack betting. You know the the, the crack of sports betting, and you can get yourself yes. in big trouble uh, betting in game. So I encourage you for more depth and more detail on parlays, teasers, and in game. Check out the archives at uh, Wager Talk and Sports Memo for these videos. But know the math on teasers, parlays, in game uh, okay. before you start getting involved uh, on a, in any significant way with the wagers. Good advice, Teddy. All right, number nine. Well, let's talk TNA right here. TNA. Trends about- and angles. Get your mind out of the gutter, Minty. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Sorry. Trends and angles. <laughs> In the NFL, as much as any sport out there, positive long-term subsets really matter. You know, Mm -hmm. you find situations. Team coming off two divisional games, now they're laying more than a touchdown against a non-conference opponent in the third week. You know, there's all of these subsets. There's no shortage of angles and trends out there. And I'm using that as a bet against, you know, your team off back-to-back division games laying more than a field goal in a non-conference game. It's it's one of many... (laughs) angles that are out there and these are longer term angles five year 10 year 20 year angles um right the nfl has got more than any other sport and they're worth considering especially when we talk about division versus non-conference games there's coaching angles coaches that are great in current in, in certain roles you know mm-hmm. uh coaches that are and you read off a bye you know I mean, there's there's a uh, plenty of coaching angles i want to talk coordinator angles as well because as you start getting good at this, all right, the coaches, yeah, you pay attention to the coaches, but your attention focuses a lot more on the offensive and defense coordinators as you uh, do this more. And the coordinators themselves have all kinds of angles. Some coordinators are great favorites. Some coordinators are great underdog. Some coordinators can shut down elite defenses. Some coordinators always get burned by elite defenses. You can find an enormous number of st- you know, trends and angles out there. You take them all with a grain of salt, but Mm -hmm. when you're building a case to make a bet and you find, hey, it falls into this positive long-term subset and this positive expectation long-term subset, you know, you're on the fence. Now you're not on the fence anymore. Now it's a bet. Um, So I do pay attention to the long-term trends and angles. You don't want the team-specific stuff. The Jets are 0-9 on Thursdays. You don't want the stupid stuff, you know? Right. But specific. the trends and angles uh, that matter, 
And again, one or two, when you see a whole subset of them, you're like, wow, here's one and here's another one. Here's another one. This is a bad. And you can see the mar- the, the betting markets are betting against the favorite in this spot. You say, oh, the, you know, there's there's something to be said for paying attention to at least some of the uh, subsets that we're talking about in the trends and angles. And specifically, the league-wide stuff, the coaching stuff, and the coordinator stuff. Mm-hmm. The team stuff, the day of the week stuff. Not so much. It's got it's got to pass the smell test. It's got to pass the does this make sense test. Uh, that said, okay. there's plenty of TNA out there that passes the does it make sense test, and you need to have that at least as a piece of your overall NFL handicapping repertoire. Right. Good point. Okay. Number ten. Teddy T. <laughs> I need a sip. I I'm gonna do that every time. I do that every time. I might need two <laughs> sips here. Yeah, I'm actually thirsty now watching you drink. Yeah. So mm-hmm. here's the con. And, and this could probably be number one on the list. Okay. But it's not. It, 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 I, I thought it was better at the end than at the beginning. Okay. It was the best to last. And this is, what, this is, this is the, the reason why. Okay. okay. Value. I talked at the top about you want to be betting on good teams, betting against ve- bad teams. You want to find teams that offer value early. And even sometimes the, you know, t- uh, com- bad competitive teams will offer value uh, that that the bottom feeders won't. But right. recognize <laughs> this: value ebbs and flows. Okay, what's hey. the best NFL team you've ever seen? You know, the one we're always talking about is the 2008 Patriots, right? You know, the Patriots team that went 16 and 0 in the regular season. That's the best NFL team I've ever seen. Yeah. They went nine and one ATS their first ten games. What oh, crap? They went one and eight ATS their last nine games. Okay, including an offer in the playoffs. And a loss mm-hmm. in the Super Bowl against the Giants. The value was there, and then the value wasn't. Last uh-huh. year, 2019, the Baltimore Ravens, they started 1-5 and five ATS. Right, yeah. Beautiful start. I made I, I cashed a couple <laughs> tickets against Baltimore early. And then, uh, how'd they finish? 9-1 and one against the number their last 10. All right. Yep. And then, after that 9-1 and one run, what happened to their playoff game? Wildly overvalued. Lost by multiple touchdowns, ATS. Yep. Value ebbs and flows throughout the course of a season. Teams that were undervalued in week one, and now they've won and covered four in a row, they're not likely to be undervalued in, in week five. You know? Right. Um, but you will consistently find these, and I'm going to call them you know, half-season runs, six-week runs. When you can get on a team, And know at the start of the week, hey, I'm riding this team. I'm betting them here. They're value-laden right now. It makes your job so much easier. You know, you're like, these are two teams I'm betting on right now, and here's one I'm betting against. You know, Mm -hmm. and you got three wagers to make before you've even done any handicapping. Um, So recognize, you know, any handicapping for that particular week. But recognize that value is going to ebb and flow. Teams that are hot for an extended period are not going to be hot forever against the spread. The market always catches up. And teams that are dismal, again, the Dolphins last year. The first mm-hmm. month of the season is the worst team we've ever seen. i never seen a team wor- a worse than Miami the first. The rest of the year, uh-huh. they're monster moneymakers. Monster moneymakers. Mm-hmm. Um, winning straight up record. So recognize that ebb and flow, and a team that was an easy bet on or bet against three weeks ago may not have that same characteristic today. Um, mm-hmm. And recognize that even when a team... Even when the Patriots are 9-1 to ATS, you're like, oh, my God, I can't step in front of them. I can't step in front of them. Yeah, you can. Yes, yeah. you can. <laughs> uh, your team's yeah, like, one and eight their last nine games. You're like, I can't, I can't back this team. I can't back. Yes, you can. <laughs> because the mm-hmm. markets have now overreacted uh, to their struggles as opposed to under. So, you know, the value ebbs and flows. Recognize that and adjust accordingly. Right. I like that one the best. You're right. It should have been number one. All right, our last (laughs) one, Teddy. You talk about this all the time in every video. Line shop and the money management. We have to talk about it every time. And of all the sports, okay, of all the sports out there, NBA is right there with it. But NFL, those half points matter. If you're laying three and a half in a game that should be minus three, you're screwed. You're not going to win long term. It's not going to happen. And you say, that's just a half point. It's just a half point. If you're taking plus two and a half and the line's plus three, especially around those key numbers of three and seven, uh, uh, 
you have to line jump. Of all the sports, the NFL, you have to line jump. And the beauty of it in the NFL is you have all week to do it. Mm-hmm. All right. Oh, you know, it's not like an NBA game where, boom, the lines come out and then you got 24 hours and then the game's being played. In the NFL, yeah. you can see where the markets are. As long as you have access to multiple books, you have the ability to line shop. And yep. if you're trying to do this without access to multiple books, you're not going to be successful. I mean, it's you know, that's, that's an, a prerequisite is you can't be betting with one bookie or one uh, offshore or one book here in Vegas. Um, you need to have multiple options. Mm-hmm. So... Those half points really do matter in the NFL as much or more than in any sport. NBA is the only one that comes close. And we talk about money management. I, I mean, what does everyone do when they have a bad NFL? So not everyone. What do many beginning bettors do when they have a bad NFL Sunday afternoon? They go double or nothing on Sunday night. And then on Sunday night, if that loses, they go double or nothing on Monday night. They don't have to pay their man on Tuesday. You know, I was a bookie. I remember the drill. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That, in my mind, is not the best way to do this. Yeah. <laughs> when you st- Anytime you start doing double or nothings, you know, and the biggest trouble I ever got in new sports betting was doing, you know, I did a double or nothing to, throughout the back half of bowl season. I kept losing and I lost the last one. And that was that. And now it's, okay, a big double. And now you're spending the next right. two months working for someone and not betting at all. Uh, that sucked. And it stuck in my mind. That was, you know, and also that was when I said I, I'm not gonna, I, I can't do this half-assed anymore. If you're gonna bet, I, I have to take it seriously. Uh, so yeah. as a lesson, it was a good lesson for me. But you know, when you're when you're chasing your losers, when you're upping your bet sizes, and you're not seeing things clearly, you know, these are recipes for disaster. And money management in the in any sport is is crucial in the NFL. The psychology of the NFL is such that it's it's as important as anything. So the key is don't chase when you're down. Don't up your bet mm-hmm. size when you're down. When you want to be increasing your bet sizes is when you're seeing things clearly and winning, not when you're not seeing anything right and losing. So mm-hmm. drop those half points and don't blow your bankroll in a weekend <laughs> you know, yeah. or a bad week or a bad month. Um and, you know, uh, this one goes to 11. Yeah, that's number 11. Um, it matters. It does matter. Absolutely. Good points, Teddy. Good stuff as always. That actually went by really quick. Thank you so much for your time. Everyone give Teddy a follow on Twitter at Teddy underscore covers. Give us a follow on Wager Talk at Wager Talk and me on Twitter if you want to at Minty Bet. Thank you. See you again 